Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Take your seats. <laughs> Let's come to order. <laughs> That's what I feel like we should be saying. Welcome to the 19th annual John Howard Burst Jr. Memorial Keynote Event. I'm Betsy Peck Learned, Dean of University Libraries, and I'd like to thank you all so much for coming. And I'm sorry that we had to be here in this courtroom today instead of in the Mary Tuft White Center, but um, somebody else beat us out, so that's why we're here. Uh, this evening's keynote panel, along with the exhibition currently mounted in the library's exhibition cases, a satellite exhibit at Rogers Free Library in Bristol, and the two reading um, group discussions that were held there yesterday comprise the University Library's John Howard G Burst Jr. program. The program celebrates a milestone anniversary of a publication of an important work of literature. This year's selection, Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut, is celebrating its 50th year of publication and was selected by the Burst Committee, a group of Roger Williams faculty, staff and students, and a representative from Rogers Free Library in Bristol. This committee is chaired by Professor Adam Braver, our library program director. And um, when we selected this book, Adam wrote up a little summary of what, why we thought this book was, was relevant to today. And I just wanted to read a little bit of that to give you a sense of why the committee selected the book. Slaughterhouse-Five was the perfect anti-war novel of the 60s, mixing deep concerns about human conflict with the kind of experimental writing for which that era is so remembered. It's a remarkable work that reads as freshly now as on its publication day 50 years ago. Vonnegut, who began his writing career with more traditional science fiction writing, all the rage in publishing in his formative years of the 50s, blends sci-fi and literary writing into a be truly beautiful and timeless work. Any reader of Vonnegut cannot help note his natural gift for humor, his flights of inspired imagination, and his world-weary love of his fellow human beings with all their faults and foibles. I thought that was a good, good reasons for selecting the book. So tonight we have three Vonnegut enthusiasts up here in the panel. Uh, Rick Moody, Ginger Strand, and Nanette Vonnegut, whom Professor Adam Braver will introduce in a moment. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the BURST program, um, which we celebrate, this is the 19th year, so next year's the big one, big 20 years. We're hugely grateful to Robert Blaze, an alumnus, who with his gift to the university in the year 2000 made these events possible. Unfortunately, he could not be here tonight, but we're honored that his daughter, Jennifer Murphy, raise your hand, <laughs> is here to represent the family. Mr. Blaze's gift to the university was in honor of his mentor and friend, John, Professor John Howard Burst, Jr. Professor Burst was a scholar of Herman Melville and Walt Whitman and a collector of first editions. The, the gift supports the annual commemoration of a book celebrating an anniversary of its publication with an exhibition, a library book fund for collecting works related to the exhibit, and a keynote lecture. The donation also supports travel this year for Christine Fagan, collection management librarian and curator of the exhibition, along with two Burst student fellows from the honors program, Nicole Anderson and Zachary Santoro, who visited the Vonnegut archives at Indiana University Bloomington to select items for the exhibition. It's such a great experiential learning opportunity for our students, and we are, really appreciate the support from our honors program. For those of you who have not yet seen the exhibition, I encourage you to please come to the library to the exhibit cases on the, th on the first floor. It will be up until the end of March, so you have plenty of time to come back if you don't have time this evening. Um, I'd also like to point out that we have prepared, um, in the library, we've prepared a research guide and selected images of the artifacts, um, which are available on the library's website at the Burst page. There's a link from the library's homepage to the Burst page, but if you just want to simply Google um, RW Library Bursts, you'll end up at that page. And now I'd like to invite Professor Adam Braver to introduce our panelists and moderate the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Um, and I um, would feel, um, I wouldn't sleep well tonight if I did not note that, that Ted Delaney's uh, hand was in more of that description than mine. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 um, I think what I'm going to do just to get started, because you probably would like to hear more from the panelists than from me, um, is refer you to the program for, for the bios, because the bios are all in this program. If you didn't get one, you can grab one. 
uh, on the way out. So just to, to, to get started, um, uh, to my left is Rick Moody, um, writer, uh, author, novelist, educator. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ginger Strand, um, uh, biog uh, mostly non-creative, non-fiction uh, writer these days. Um, who wrote this book, uh, Brothers Vonnegut, which is a tremendous book if anybody has not had a chance to read it, particularly in understanding um, um, a lot of things, an understanding of, about uh, Kurt and Bernard, their relationship, the, um, the way they, uh, for, for me, uh, particularly the way they inspired each other um, um, in many ways. Um, and then Nanette Vonnegut, um, um, who, um, daughter of Kurt Vonnegut, um, and also, um, I know you've done some writing, writing mm -hmm. about your father as well, and, um, and I also want to not um, reduce you to just being daughter of Kurt Vonnegut, but also uh, quite a prolific artist yourself. And, um, so, I'm gonna start off with a couple of, uh, with some general questions. Um, I'm hoping that, that many of you out there have questions. Um, I'm, I'm prepared to do all the talk, you know, to do all the, the questioning if we need to, but, but please feel free to, um, you know, to, to jump in with questions that, that you might have as we go along. There's a microphone down here, um, which is probably better to come down and ask the question at the queue so that it, uh, so that it can be heard by all. Um, so I want to start more generally to all of you, um, and, and um, because we're talking about Slaughterhouse-Five on the uh, 50th anniversary, um, and um, really, so I th I, since, it's, since it was published, you know, it's been part of our culture and part of our, our literary culture and discourse um, and um, has brought meaning to people in many different ways for many different reasons. Um, for some, I suppose it's the message um, or theme of the book, which we often hear talk about as an anti-war book. Um, for some, it opens hidden worlds and wounds of the psyche. Um, and for others, uh, perhaps those in my particular camp, um, it opened up ways of thinking about what you could do with writing and or art, um, a type of freedom from the conventions of um, uh, conventional narrative or storytelling in order to get at the heart of something different. But I'm asked, I want to start with you and ask all of you what, you know, what it's meant to you uh, over the years and why, um, you know, when you think back on it, why you found the, you know, why you think of the book as being meaningful for yourself, not in the, in the whole sphere. Shall I start? Do you want me to start? Am I close enough to Alexa here that everybody can hear me? Okay. Um, I mean, I actually came to the book and to Vonnegut generally rather late uh, after college. Uh, I wasn't one of these youthful Vonnegut um, obsessives. And someone commented, an editor commented on something of mine by saying, I don't, I don't like this line, I want you to take it out. It, it references Slaughterhouse-Five. And I was like, well, I didn't mean to. So I went and read the book. And in fact, I thought it was the most brilliant anti-war novel I'd ever read. Um, and so I said, leave it in. I want to reference Slaughterhouse-Five. <laughs> Thank you very much. But in then becoming more and more familiar with the book over time, I think that, I mean, it's definitely an anti-war novel, but what it really is to me, or what it personally means to me, is it's a book about death. It's, you know, and nobody ever talks about the, the subtitle. Everybody talks about the children's crusade, but there's also the duty dance with death. And it's, it's not just about war, it's about how we all deal with this uh, miserable thing, this miserable way that we have to exist in the world, which is on a trajectory of time where we move from birth to death and how we deal with absence and loss and mm -hmm. the whole vast uh, pageant of misery that is human history. Um, I was 14 uh, when Slaughter House came out, um, and my father, I knew him as a struggling writer. Uh, I, I don't think any of us saw it coming, the, the impact that this book would have, but it was, it came into the world in, in a most powerful way, personally. Um, in some ways, it, <laughs> I say it's like the aliens took him away. Uh, 
because that's he became a celebrity. Um, but he, my father would give me his writing to read, you know, since I was young, and he really cared about what I, how I was responding to it. Even when I, I was 10 years old, it, if I would laugh, he'd come running into the room. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You know, really, he was working it out as if he, he wanted to entertain. And that really, um, I think that was Cat's Cradle. I remember reading that. But Slaughterhouse-Five, to me, I knew he was wrestling with something. That's what I understood as his daughter, um, as somebody who lived with him. And it, it, I, I know what it is for, to live with a writer, um, how hard it was, you know, every day, get going and doing it, and being happy when he was somewhat happy when he came out, my mother cracking the ice to get the drink going so he could uh, get relief. But I didn't read that. I think I read the book because I felt like I had to understand what it is, what's all the big deal. And uh, for me, it was more, it made me very self-conscious because I was the daughter of suddenly this famous person. So I came to Slaughterhouse-Five later in life because I was ready to look at it. And I would say it was maybe 10 years ago. So in my, when I was 50, <laughs> I read Slaughterhouse-Five. And I'm reading it, and I throw it on the ground. Sorry, I don't swear. <laughs> like, that, that's my father. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. it. You know, what I saw was a, a, a brilliant work that was magic, how he cut up time and such a small book. Um, so I'm still reeling from it in a way. So I'm here to share, you know, my coming to it late and also what it was like watching him do this thing, which was um, practice, practice, practice. Uh, 20 years, you know. Um, so I want to share that with anybody who, if you want to be a writer, that's what it is. And it, it wasn't a total joy, but what it was such a, it's such a beautiful gift to the world. So I'm happy to be here and talking about him as the man and as the writer and <clears throat> how I had to come at it later in life because it was too, too big a thing. So Am I understanding, Annie, you didn't, you didn't, the first time you read it was just 10 years ago? Or no, you I'm sure I did read it, but it was, it was so, like, I was so self-conscious about yeah. it. And you're and in, in the book, some I mean, ways you're named I in the book, I kind of resent, resented it a little bit. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but now I can handle it. Hmm. And I'm with everybody, I'm in it, you know, with, <laughs> with right. everybody who, who loves it. And... Um, it's, you know, I tell people it sort of reminds me of uh, uh, Fred Astaire, you watch him dance, you know, and you, it's just like, on, you can't fathom that type of grace and beauty, but what it takes to get there is a lot of, you know, practice, so. Um, I'm just a guy, I'm actually, I'm one of the youthful Vonnegut fans that Ginger alluded to. So I read the entire body of work as a teenager every single word that was available then. I read in the middle 70s. And, um, and I started, oddly enough, with a book that has a more mixed critical uh, sort of status, namely Breakfast of Champions. And um, I read that because that was the one that had most recently come out when I began my um, sort of unquenchable need to have read every everything that Kurt Vonnegut wrote. And I felt then, and I still feel, um, that Breakfast of Champions is a great, great book. And that aspects of Breakfast of Champions are genuinely revolutionary. The way the art works in the book, for example. And also the sort of mixed idea about protagonist that's in that book. And I further greatly, greatly admired and continue to admire the way that the character called Kilgore Trout worked through multiple novels by Kurt Vonnegut as a kind of alter ego. Um, and upon finishing that book, I then went and read every other book by Kurt Vonnegut. And it relates to the discussion of, of 
of Slaughterhouse Five in the following way. As a writer of somewhat experimental work, um, who you know later on as a as a writing student was studying with sort of lionized experimental writers of the 60s and 70s, I had this odd journey that I made um, that I was talking about with Ginger and Nanette earlier, in which I found myself among experimental writers who frequently, systematically suppressed the role of Kurt Vonnegut mm -hmm. in American experimental writing. And this was really odd for me because these works had been so systematically important and um, fundamental to my own development. So as a writing student, I found myself sort of furtively wanting to go back and think about the ways in which these various works um, sort of challenged our ideas about well-made um, orderly narratives, realism, uh, storytelling, et cetera, et cetera. In Breakfast of Champions, it's what I just cited to you, some of the ways that it's highly interruptive of normal novel writing procedure. But it's impossible not to have that discussion without going back to Slaughterhouse-Five, and especially without talking about how time works in Slaughterhouse-Five. Ginger's book is so um, important about physics and the way in which the Vonnegut brothers sort of digested ideas of science and what science meant at the time that these works were being written. And one aspect of that is that Slaughterhouse-Five becomes a book that's slipped out of time in a way, right? So that's incredibly interesting. I always say to writing students that there's no story without time. Time is the element. And really what story is, is time being worked out on bodies. That's what a story is. But this idea that the war is a thing in Slaughterhouse-Five that's so traumatic mm -hmm. and has such an impact that orderly time is ruptured in the reconsideration of the war and its, and its effect. That, that's just incredibly powerful and interesting. And in putting human subjectivity and the kind of chaos of human subjectivity so at the center of the book that the book is bent mm -hmm. by that experience. You know, it's sort of how we think about time now as we approach black holes. So time as we approach black holes slows in this way and becomes sort of spaghetti thin if you read Hawking and so on. Um, but in this book, Slaughterhouse-Five, it's subjectivity and memory that are distorted um, because of the war. The war is sort of the black hole into which the narrative falls. So for me as a writer then, this experience of these books sort of made me who I am. And it just became re really super important at a certain moment developmentally to say and remember how imperative um, Vonnegut's influence was to me. I think Adam was saying the same thing at the outset, you know. Um, these works are gateway drugs to <laughs> thinking about narrative structure and thinking in new ways about narrative structure. And it was all done in a way that was so organic and so human that you can't see the joins. Mm -hmm. You can't see how structurally canny they are because that voice is so warm and so human, you know. The other thing I'll say about it, and then I'll shut up, is that as I was preparing to come, I reread um, the introduction to Mother Night, where he talks about the Dresden firebombing prior to Slaughterhouse Five. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a dry run for talking about memory and his own experiences of the war that become absolutely fundamental and baked in. Ugh, wrong word. Um, uh, but become fundamental to the structure and the conception of Slaughterhouse Five. And the, the description is so devastating in Mother Night, so devastating, that it's impossible not to think of, of that sort of distorted time field in Slaughterhouse Five as not being his own attempt to reckon with what he saw and had been through. Absolutely. Yeah. When 
and we've talked about this earlier, but have been prior to this panel. Um, can you understand why it took 20 years to write the mm -hmm. book? When I mean, yeah, I totally can. I mean, what Nanette is saying is, you know, that writers have to write through material, as you or I would say, you know, to get to the kind of life experience that enables the really incredible great book sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know? Just not to say that I love Sirens of Titan, that's a novel I deeply love. Um, uh, and Mother Night and many of those short stories that were written prior to Slaughterhouse Five are still incredible to me. But sometimes the subject and the writer and the moment in history meet. Mm -hmm. And then something really incredible happens. Yeah. I have to say, in, in reading Slaughterhouse Five, there was one part that made me. Uh, um, it just took my breath away uh, when he said, That was me. That was then, that was me. Mm -hmm. And he, he put himself right there, in, you know, in the telling. And as his daughter. <laughs> You know, and, and he was, that, that was my father, you know, at what, 20, 21. And I just, uh, it was just an inc incredibly moving moment. And uh, that, that was, I don't know whether to call it a trick. <laughs> it was magic. And I think that was kind of groundbreaking, that type of writing. I, I want to ask, why are people so snotty about my father? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a simple answer. Want to know what it is? What? Too successful. Yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. <laughs> I, even when I was working on Brothers Vonnegut, every now and then I would come, run across, you know, someone at a college, some literary professor, and they'd say, what's your next book? And I'd say, I'm writing a book about Vonnegut. And they'd be like, ugh, ugh. <laughs> you know, good luck. But yeah, I think it's pure and simple jealousy mm -hmm. that, that he was able to do something so profound and yet something that could reach out to anybody, you know, could reach out to a 14-year-old. Mm -hmm. or... That's a story I hear a lot, people like you, you know, 14, 15, it's the first stuff, it's what brought them to reading, was my father's work. So in that way, uh, it's made a, hu a huge impact on, on young people. Yeah, but I have no patience for this snootiness. <laughs> Neither did my father. <laughs> Although it did bother him. It yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I want to, I have a question and then I, I'm, I have a question for all three and then please feel free to, to, to join in with some questions. Um, and, and I'm really channeling um, some of the discussion that's come up um, from students and also there was a, a reading group um, last night at the Public Library in Bristol, which many people who were uh, there last night are here. Um, and, um, and this question seems to come up in, in different contexts, specifically about the book, and that is particularly about when it goes into um, Trafalmador and the aliens and, and, and whether it in fact is doing that or whether this is um, part of the, the, the so-called PTSD um, of it. Um, and, and actually somebody, I don't know if she's here um, right now, who, who was at the um, discussion last night was a, a specialist who, thera uh, who, who sp a therapist who specializes in PTSD, working with people with PTSD, who, uh, and, and it was brought up that that is a sort of a modern phenomena in terms of diagnosing it and understanding it as opposed to people of, of say my generation whose grandparents or parents served in World War II and we just understood it as silence, um, <laughs> you know, or, or reticence whenever anything uh, related came up. And I guess, Nanny, I'll start with you. When you look back, and I'm not asking you to diagnose your father, but, <laughs> um, but uh, at least not in public, but, um, <laughs> um, but when, you, when you went back and read the book, did you see that as your father, as the person, I guess, is the person in the book someone that you recognize? Like, when you think back at the person, can you think back to the person you knew growing up? Was that person in the same person um, in, in the book, in particular, the trauma uh, of the war? Well, you know, he had a, a way of speaking, and it was so so much him, you know, in the book, in, in the way he moved, the way he talked, and. That's what I was so touched by because he was sh he was revealing himself in in this book that in a way that I hadn't he had never 
would speak to us directly about what there was no time. He, he was taking care of all these kids. It was a crazy house. <laughs> and, um, and this is what he was doing behind the doors while we were, you know, scampering around. And um, no, it's taken me being older now to look back and see. I totally recognize that as his writing to save his own life, mm. really. Mm. I mean, he, he's lucky because he could write, because that's how he worked out that. Well, he said to me that all writers, artists, are working out their neuroses in their work. Um, and so that was his thing that he was, and I think he, he wouldn't have done so well in life had he not been able to write. Um, so it's just at the time, you know, I don't, I don't know. It was like, um, that's all I knew, you know, living with this man who went behind the door and, and wrote. He was grumpy, very grumpy a lot to tell you the truth, but it would be very manic and sometimes he would be uh, happy to be playing the piano and singing and, and then he, he uh, it looked like a really hard life. It didn't look like he, it was, but I see that as, as um, recovery or dealing with all this stuff, not just the war, you know, it was uh, that being the big thing, but um, losing his sister and taking on four kids and it was just one thing and another, and that was the theme uh, in his books was, you know, that life is pretty much out of control, you know, and um, he had this story about a woman who lost control of her car going through the bushes and this <laughs> people's yards, and they said, why didn't you put your foot on the brake, and she said, it's, I was too busy steering. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a metaphor he used all the time. That's what he felt he was li his life was like. He was just too busy steering. And um, so he would always say that you should write, do the art, art. It will say, do it, even if you're not good at it. You know, whatever, whatever you want to do, sing or write or whatever, it's going to help you in life. Make your soul grow. I think. It will make your soul grow. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately all these kids have taken that route. <laughs> I think, I, I'm sorry, I was, gonna, I was gonna say that your question I think is a pretty common one which is comes out of a sort of we have this sense with a book that there's a truth to it or a meaning to it and we can go in there and do our new critical you know, act activities and pull out all the symbols and come up with, okay, so this is the big answer. Mm. This is the key. The key is, like, like if, if it was a movie, the key is he's actually you know, in bed dying and right. all these things are his hallucinations and he's going, but I think that people forget that Kurt mm lived in the two worlds, right? He was, as you were saying, he was both, he was conversant in literature, very, and he was conversant in science. And science doesn't really work that way. Physics doesn't work that way. I don't know if anyone read the uh, article in the New York Times recently about how the universe is expanding faster than, we, than the physicists thought it was. And it's like, oh no, and now we have no idea why, and it could be the end of the world is coming, or it could be that our measurements are wrong, or, but science is comfortable in that world of infinite possibility of this is what we know, you know, and this is the way we kind of can read it, but it also could be this way. And I think that Slaughterhouse-Five, as a book, as a literary production, operates that way. Well, that takes me to part two of the question because the other way of reading it, and you know, the sort of the binary way of talking about it, without, um, is that it's completely real and that this is, mm -hmm. you know, this it's, fourth dimension. And, there really are and, and so on. yeah. Um, you know, in the, in the, at least in the, in the case of the book. Um, where do you think that science world came from? I mean, obviously, I, I know you, you have thoughts about where it came from, but maybe you could talk about. Um, you know, was it the influence of GE on that time at GE on the thinking of what Bernard was um, in, engaging in? Where, where do you think of that? Well, Kurt had a very good, un, unlike me, he had a very good primary education, right? Hmm. And then he went to college and majored in chemistry, so at Cornell. So he was, he was uh, conversant with science from very early on. His older brother was a PhD, MIT trained, um, 
phys physicist and chemist. And the family was very comfortable in scientific discourse. And Kurt read um, science all his life, in addition to reading fiction and novels and things. I mean, it's clear from his early work that he read Norbert Wiener's book, Cyber Cybernetics, which nobody really knows about anymore, but was a highly influential book at the time and very complicated. Um, and he included some of that in, uh, in much of his subsequent work. I mean, the whole notion of uh, there being a different kind of time one that moves backwards and forwards is, is, comes out of physics. It's not just like loopy sci-fi stuff, it's, mm -hmm. it's real. So I think that, and he was very close to Bernard who was a scientist and worked at, at the GE Research Lab. So he's, and when he too was working at the GE Research Lab in public relations, he, he had a front row seat for all this kind of crazy science that was going on at GE at the time. So he was very much involved in the scientific world um, for quite, you know, a good good portion of his youth. Can I add though that <clears throat> he hated chemistry, <laughs> yeah. yes. calculus, yes. and wanted to he shoot didn't himself. Want, he didn't want to be a scientist. <laughs> and, he just, <laughs> and he felt a lot of pressure from because Bert, Bernard was so successful. He felt like he had to follow, and then he just was relieved to get away from that. But I remember how close they were. Yeah. And how, what they talked about. And he would listen, Bernard would talk at length about the possibility of ICE-9, for instance. I saw that conversation. And, you know, it was like, as if I was like 11, and um, Bernie was trying to open the carton of the milk, I remember, <laughs> on the wrong end of it. <laughs> He's a brilliant guy. Classic Bernie. And, and trying to listen, my mother's there, and says, oh, give me that thing, give me that. And they're talking about, I remember it, about can this, is this possible? So Bernie gave him a lot, mm -hmm. a huge amount. And I think he did, he was a voracious reader of everything. And one of his favorite books was um, The Mask of Sanity. Uh-huh. You know that book about sociopaths? Yeah, I've read that book. <laughs> that's quite, yeah, that's interesting. That, that was something he was interested in. But yeah, Bernie was huge. Was he inspiring Bernie too, do you, do you think? Like when, you, when that conversation was going on, and I know we're testing memory and, and you I were think 11. But. Bernie just adored him, you know, just loved giving him what he needed and was mm -hmm. entertained by him, but I don't think he, I think he appreciated what his little brother was doing, but I don't think he quite, he, he didn't have, he didn't have the uh, um, artistic spirit that my father had, but I mean, they, they meshed beautifully. But his sister also had a huge in, influence on him. Um, Ali was very, uh, ha, um, <clears throat> not at all science-y, it was just very ethereal and an incredible artist and very, very funny. And, uh, you know, I never met her, but she's like this huge, she's like an angel in my life, um, the way he talked about her. And I think, you know, speaking of influences, it's not like there's Bernie who, who taught him about science, and then there's Ali who taught him about timing and humor. So. Does anybody have any questions before I? The first one's always hard. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Right. He was a funny person, He physically very funny. I mean, yeah. he had a body humor. Yep. What's the question? <laughs> Oh, so how the humor fit, how the humor of the family fit in with the creativity. Yeah. Something from another angle, the way the humor often does, or maybe just loosen yourself up for I don't know, I just, I've read a lot about her body's sense of humor and some of the practical jokes and all those things I've talked about. I don't know if that fits in it. I can tell one 
funny story, just because it's so fun, about <laughs> Bernie's sense of humor. When he and, he and Kurt were driving home to visit the family at one point, and the car broke down, and they got out and decided to hike to the nearest gas station and op opened the hood and left it open. And Kurt said to Bernie, is there anything else we should do to show that we haven't abandoned this car, that we're in distress? And Bernie said, we could slash the tires. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Rick, what are your thoughts? I mean, you write with a lot of humor, but not necessarily satire, but, but with humor. What do you think that, that humor opens up, or, or I mean, in writing, but, but maybe if you're, we're also thinking about Vonnegut or Slaughterhouse Five, how the humor inspire, you know, t is, allows the, the narrative to go to certain places? There's a way that I, I don't think Vonnegut is funny at all. Mm -hmm. And that's because I think it's. The work is very sad in spots, very sad. And so I feel like it's that kind of humor, and it's the kind that I really, really often love, that sort of um, uh, W.C. Fields tragicomedy kind of humor, you know, where, um, where it's really wrapped up in character and wrapped up in voice, uh, and not surface comedy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's really hard to not see the work as having a highly melancholy cast, but you know, sometimes that kind of melancholy can kind of have a hilarity wrapped into it, you know, which is about seeing the world as sort of often tragic um, and often, uh, sort of throwing up surprises that are the grimmest possible surprises and the only way to contextualize that so that, that it's not annihilating is to is to find humor in it you know so for me um uh you know a lot of times the comedy in Vonnegut has that has a sort of real melancholy kind of Welchmertz aspect to it um that's really rich. I did also want to go back to the trial Famidorians mm -hmm. for a moment and just say that um, that it's impossible for me to not think of Vonnegut as digesting and responding to the science fiction of the 40s and 50s and um, and to re therefore to reduce trial Famidor to a merely allegorical vehicle or to say just that it's PTSD oriented robs the work of imagination for me, you know, and mm -hmm. and the science fiction that he knew of, what was the guy's name who killed Rick Trout's based on? Somebody Salmon or something like that? Like there's sure. an actual guy. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not going to be able to think of it on the spot. Um, you know, so somebody's muttering it, I can tell. Somebody know? Yeah. Or anyway. Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> um, Killer Child is based on an actual science fiction. Richard Sturgeon. Writer. There you go. Sturgeon. <laughs> Salmon Sturgeon. Um, uh, 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 you know, real ideas and aspects of of science fiction were getting processed through this highly experimental veneer. Um, and some of that was celebratory, not like a let's burlesque science fiction, but you know, real ideal, uh, idealistic and um, uh, carefully considered philosophical ideas are being presented in science fiction. Vonnegut's going to refract that through this lens that was his. And so I feel like, yeah, okay, trial famidorians are post-traumatic. Sure, that's an idea that you can definitely get to. But, but I don't think that you should inhabit that idea so as to reduce possible levels of the work. Mm -hmm. I think it should be able to function on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. And one level that's of real interest is, let's not make them allegorical at all. Let's just say this character, this narrator, is having this experience mm -hmm. and sort of come at it from that direction and see what are the emotional ramifications of that. Like to me that makes the work richer and gives it a more of a polyphony 
And I, yeah, yeah that's I, that actually cool. happened yeah. recently, right? In the movie Arrival, which is basically right. Tralfamadorians come to Earth, <laughs> and you know, this there's this encounter with this way of. I mean, I think it was totally ripped off from Vonnegut with this different way of viewing time, and. The Earth is saved from destruction because this woman learns to understand and see time backwards and forwards and see all moments at once and, and to embrace the death of her own child, which is kind of in a way what all of this is about in Slaughterhouse-Five is sort of how do we get to a point where we just see, see it all as one big whole instead of life and then the end of life. Absolutely, and I'm guessing 14-year-old Rick Moody was not thinking of allegorical. Uh, it was just reading it and having the experience and being Absolutely. affected by it. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Was it Slaughterhouse Five at 15? Sure, definitely, okay. all of them, all every of them. one. <laughs> yeah. There is a relief, a comic relief aspect to the to the humor, though. I think that just functions on a very, very simple craft level. Yep. Like the mm -hmm. the book would be so such a slog, right? If you were just and when you get to those British, uh, those British prisoners of war putting on Cinderella and then being so upset that the Americans are so disgusting that they dig a whole new latrine the next day, that is like mm -hmm. a set piece that's hilarious and, and poignant and melancholy and, but allows a little bit of a change of texture in the prose. Jim, you had a question? Mm -hmm. yeah. over here next. When Slaughterhouse Five comes out, we're in another war, a much more controversial one than the one presented in the novel. And I wonder if Vietnam shaped, inspired the novel in any way. Well, I, I remember how angry he was. He was working on the book, you know, for 20 years. He was, it was already going, it was almost done. Um, but, you know, I, um, he had sons who were up for the draft, and he was. He and my mother were screaming at the television, you know, at the news. I remember that, um, and I, you know, I didn't know it then, but it was. He was back in it, in the rage of what was of what was happening to these young men. Um, so, I think the timing of the book coming out was maybe luck. But I, I don't think he finished it up on it because of the Vietnam War. But he was certainly involved. I mean, one way to think about that is about sort of theory of reception, right? Which is always so interesting. What does it mean to the audience to be reading it at that moment? You know, I'm a keen fan of the novel called Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. And for me, Vonnegut led directly to Pynchon. Like there's a real connection between those two writers for me, partly because of the science and the fixation on science in both those writers. But Gravity's Rainbow is also a book about the Second World War that's really a kind of crypto novel about Vietnam. And I think you can sort of make the same case about Catch-22 as well. So here's this environment where we're reading these books with the war that's at hand, and there's no way not to see war commentary as a kind of cri critical apparatus that's going to be funneled into how we consume them. So once the book is your property in 1970, let's say, and Vonnegut isn't going to change it again, it's definitely going to be read through that lens. and and that becomes a fact of sort of how it does what it does. So a, a book that advertises itself as kind of being against war, but also with a real kind of weariness about whether that's even an effective thing to do, that's, that's definitely going to bear on how you think about Vietnam, unless I miss my guess. Yes? Uh, I think Kurt Vonnegut's work is very unique.
Well, I'm a, I'm a hardliner when it comes to this nonfiction fiction question. I think if you um, stray at all from the facts, and I know there are nonfiction writers out in the world who would disagree with me, but my, my conviction is that if you stray at all from the facts, you're writing fiction. Um, but it's highly influenced by history and autobiography and all those, uh, you know, all those other non-fictional things. But I, I have no problem just calling Kurt Vonnegut's work literary fiction. He, he was happy with fiction. But it's also a magpie form, right? The novel's a magpie form. It wants to engulf and devour. <laughs> so it does, you know. And especially in the late 60s, you know. It's like that's a thing that the novel did at that moment is pirate and, and, and sort of uh, systematically vivisect other forms. This, they're kind of a cruel mockery of the novel, right? American life with his optometrist career and his optometrist son and his overweight wife and his Cadillac and it's, he's very cruel <laughs> to his characters. I mean, his bitterness. Was he unhappy living the American dream in the fifties? He's uh, dealing with his Midwestern Indianapolis life. Um, that's what he left. He and my mother left that it was very conservative, but there was a love-hate relationship. So he would make fun of people quite a bit. <laughs> um, and, and he could be he, he could be he could be cruel, but I, I think writers can be cruel. And you know, sometimes I would see pe people in his writing that I recognized. <laughs> And I think as a writer, you, you know, that, that's a thing you have to deal with, you know, hurting people a little bit. But yeah, he was kind of mean about the, the Indianapolis Midwestern thing, the Hoosiers. <laughs> it was really funny about Hoosiers. He also was, he would probably, if he were alive today, would be a democratic socialist, right? <laughs> um, he was skeptical of the so-called American dream. And, you know, at the time that he was working most on Slaughterhouse-Five, he had taken a job in Iowa City that turned out wonderful for him, but that he didn't want to take originally so much because it was going to take him away from his family, but he needed to support his family. He was having a hell of a time making a living. He had made... You're saying things very differently than I do, but <laughs> go ahead. Well, I, yeah. he, money was a problem, Yes, is yep. what I'm trying to say, right? Yep. Um, that it wasn't easy to make a living, and, and in particular, he'd been making a living as a short story writer, sort of, you know, struggling along as a short story writer. Television came along and killed the short story market. So there's a there's a kind of reason behind this sort of, sort of well -to -do cri critique of yeah yeah <laughs> but also a desire a constant desire and correct me if I'm wrong nanny but I think that throughout his life he was skeptical of the aspect of the american dream that is where everything is about money and um, keeping up with the Joneses, right? Mm. As he had a different ethic. Yeah, we didn't fit in at all on the cape. Oh, man. Um, yeah, hell. I'm curious when he was out in public, there were people that smiled and he hated the book. He was banned. Yeah. There were groups of people that thought it was Especially uh, in Indianapolis, <laughs> his own people. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, yeah. people like the and restaurants that come over and attack them. I, I never, I never heard of that happen, happening to him personally, but he would get wind of his book being burned in North Dakota, uh, North Dakota, 1974, thrown in the, in the furnace, fire furnace. Did you hear about that book burning? Mm -hmm. uh, and that happened, that hap keeps happening now. Um, but I would say he got more support, you know, than not. 
Um, but early on, he'd go to Indianapolis to sign books and nobody would sign up. Even his own relatives wouldn't come because because uh, the swear words. <laughs> and Yeah, that was a big, I mean, he was very, uh, you know, ahead of his time because my, my mother warned me that I was going to get people saying things about your, your father writes dirty, dirty books. She warned me that you might hear that, you know, in, in, in uh, fifth or sixth grade. And I was really excited. <laughs> I didn't know what for the dirty books. But um, yeah, he got a lot of trouble for a long time. And then suddenly he became, you know, famous for this work, so I don't really feel badly for him. You know, I think he's very, he did very well. But it was so offensive to him the, uh, when the book banning and the book burnings were what completely knocked, you know, knocked him out. And I will add, we heard last night in 2000, the, in Coventry, yeah. in Coventry yeah. Rhode Island, the book was, was banned, you know, so, um, so this is not a historical um, discussion we're, we're, we're having. Um, in the, um, the name of time, because it's been just about an hour, um, one of the, you know, part of the impetus for choosing the book was that it was the 50th anniversary um, of the book. Um, and why do you think we're still talking about it 50 years later? Like, why, why is this book a book we're talking about 50 years later? Because it's timeless. It stands the time, you know, I mean, I, I don't think my father knew, you know, what he was doing, but it stands the test of time. I mean, anybody can pick it up and read it at any time, and it, it's an incredible. And what do you piece think makes it timeless? Uh, because it, oh God, ask somebody else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the themes, the themes obviously, but I think it's important to continue recognizing that it is an incredibly well crafted book. Yeah. Um, the you know the more you the more you read it, I mean I re I reread it on the train up from New York this morning, and I was just like every time I read it I I see more into the artistry, the the repetitions and the uh, the way he carries out threads and seems to do it so effortlessly, um, and it seems so there's such a you know there'll be a wealth of detail like someone's eating a a Three Musketeer bar when he's talking to her on the phone, and then the Three Musketeers come into the book. You know, there's this kind of, it's, it's just brilliant juggling yeah. act of using all of these, these metaphors and these seemingly casual asides and things to circuitously come at this mm -hmm. huge theme. So hence the frustration of it not being taken seriously yeah. you know, as a book when it has that level yeah, of no, artistry. To write like that, to write so brilliantly and with such craft, and then to be dismissed as a genre, popular genre writer for 14-year-olds must have been galling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I mean, like, just great art stands the test of time. I mean, I yeah. watch, I, I, I keep bringing up Fred Astaire because he reminds me of my father. He even looks like my father, you know, it's just, but that you watch, you know, how can you ever say no to that? And that's how I think of Slaughterhouse-Five. It's just a perfect piece of art. I was talking at, in class before I came over about, um, science fiction writer Philip K. Dick. I've taught the mm -hmm. novel A Scanner Darkly by Philip K. Dick occasionally. And it's a book that's dated, really dramatically dated. And it's much harder to engage with it now because it has this sort of kind of hipster drug culture thing that just feels super um, of its moment, you know? That this, that Slaughterhouse-Five somehow managed to to completely evade that problem is of great interest, you know? And I think maybe it does have to do with the fact that time as an agent in the book is so kind of stripped out and reconstituted that it doesn't fall into an epoch of a particular period or articulation of a particular period. It wants to be outside of time somehow or only in subjective time, you know? And maybe that allows it to sort of be less preoccupied with sort of 
sort of contemporary detail in a way that would date terribly, you know. So I think that it's that it's innovation structurally makes it timeless, but also that, as Ginger was saying, sort of what it's about is on its face timeless. Mm -hmm. Which um, it's interesting in that we were watching with a group of stu with students. Um, an interview that would have run on PBS, and this was actually after he died, but they were re, re, replaying it. Um, and um, he, he was talking about being baffled by the one mistake humanity keeps making. You know, the, the one thing humanity got wrong, and that's that it keep engaging in wars, that they keep, you know, that, and he sort of goes through this litany of starting from you know, ancient times all the, all the way through now. And, it, and, and he says it almost with the, this wonderment of just how come humanity can't figure this out? Um, it's, it must be our flaw. Um, and I wonder if that's part of that, that same timelessness because it doesn't. Dresden, Vietnam, Iran, Iraq, what, you know, pick, pick, your, pick your place. Hmm. Um, that, it, that it still resonates, that, that, that core issue still resonates. In the, in the introduction to Mother Night, he says, um, Mother Night has my most obvious moral. Um, and it's not that it's such a great moral, but it is a moral, um, uh, which is what I pretend to be I become. Mm. But what's of interest to me in that introduction is that Vonnegut announces himself as a writer with moral vision, you know. Mm -hmm. And what you've just described is a person having a moral vision, you know. And I think maybe timelessness is a thing that adheres to moral vision. Because mm -hmm. it means that contemporary detail is less important than the ability of the work to have an aboutness, to really be mm -hmm. about something. And, you know, that's even leaving out the fact that this is a, a man who served in the war so it's not that he's just saying, hey, war's a bad idea as an ethical position. Right. Like, he has the experience to Absolutely. have gravity in that mm -hmm. comment. And to take it to the larger issue of what's wrong with humanity, I think one of, one of his least read novels is the very late novel, Galapagos, which is actually, I think, pretty underappreciated, um, but it's set you know, millions and millions of years of the future where humanity has evolved into these seal-like creatures um, who've gotten rid of their big brains that <laughs> caused all the trouble in human history and are just happily cavorting and in the sea. And what makes them laugh? <laughs> <laughs> they just clap their they hands. Just, yes. <laughs> all right, well, I want to thank um, Nanny, Ginger, and Rick for, for being here. I want to thank all of you for coming um, as well. There, when you leave the door, there's uh, when you leave out the door, there is a table full of cookies and um, things to eat, and snack on. So I hope you'll stick around and gather and talk and talk with each other and talk. You know, we'll, we'll be here as well too. So, uh, I was remiss in not introducing you to Professor Christine Fagan, who's our curator of the exhibit. Um, she's been giving tours. She I think she's toured out for today, <laughs> but if you have any questions when you do view the exhibit,